So whenever I get to talk in a nice room like this, I always like to imagine that I am at the cinema going to watch a movie. And my favorite movies are, of course, Le Seigneur des Anneaux. Right? The first time I saw The Fellowship of the Ring, I became an instant lifelong fan. In fact, I've spent a lot of time and money trying to look as much as possible as one of the main characters. And I mean, the resemblance is uncanny, right? Are you not, you're not seeing it? <laughs> of course, I'm forgetting the most important part, wait. <laughs> now, I mean, now it's obvious, right? We could be brothers, yeah? Now, The Lord of the Rings is not the only trilogy that I am a big fan of. This is also true for the HTTP protocol, of which the third version was standardized just last year. And H3 is a very good topic to talk to you all about today because, as you probably know, it has a lot of interesting performance features on board. And one of the nice things is you get these features almost completely for free. They are come out of the box. The only thing you need to do is to enable H3. And if you're using something like a CDN, it's very simple. You typically just have to do a flip of the switch to get all these goodies. And it gets better because you don't even need to change anything about your web pages. If you're already optimized for H2, your page will work perfectly fine on H3 as well. Those of you who were here eight years ago know that this is quite different from when we moved from H1 to H2. <laughs> so this is going to be much more uh, smoothly. So this is a good thing. We kind of can and do treat the network as a black box. We don't really need to know how exactly it works inside to get all of its benefits. So that's good. It's actually also bad, because sometimes we kind of want to, you know, poke that black box a little bit, tune a bit of its behavior with some of these features that we like to talk about. And the thing is, I think, because we don't know enough about what is actually happening inside of the box, we often misuse or inefficiently use these features to their full potential. And so something that is very powerful and very good for performance can very quickly turn out to be a major danger, a performance footka. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. I'm going to try to talk to you about some of these features how they actually work internally inside of the black box to hopefully prevent you from making some of these mistakes. Now, of course, you cannot have a proper trilogy without a prologue. And so I'm going to start talking about something called congestion control. Anyone who has ever had a networking 101 class still has nightmares about this kind of diagram. Because I'm going to talk about bandwidth. As you all know, every connection has a certain amount of bits that it can send on the wire every second. Now, this bandwidth is not fixed. It depends on the medium you're using, you know, Wi-Fi versus cellular versus cable, but it's also dynamic because you are usually using a shared network uplink with other users. This uplink has a certain maximum capacity, and you would like it to be distributed fairly across all these users and their connections. The thing is, users are constantly joining and leaving that shared uplink, and so the amount of bandwidth each connection gets actually fluctuates over time. What this all means is that it's almost impossible to know upfront how much bandwidth a new connection will have available. We don't know how fast we can send. The only thing we can do is try and discover that incrementally. And that's one thing we use this congestion control algorithm for, especially the slow start phase in the beginning. What we're going to do is we're not going to start sending maximum speed, because we don't know the maximum speed. We're going to start sending very slowly. Let's say only about 10 packets, called the initial congestion window. After we send that, we actually have to wait a full network round trip. Why? Because the receiver is going to send back what are called acknowledgments, letting the sender know that it actually received all 10 of those packets. This is an indication for the sender, yes, the network can handle this sending rate. So let's try something a bit more aggressive. Let's double it, go to 20 packets. After that, we again need to wait a full round trip. If all acknowledgments come through, we double again, 40. This keeps on going until we finally hit, in this example, round trip number five, packet loss. Meaning that one or more of our packets were not acknowledged by the receiver. They were actually dropped 
on the network. <coughs> this is a very clear indication that the network can't handle the current data rate, that it's becoming congested. And so we're probably using a bit too much bandwidth for good. And so we need to lower the send rate again, and after that, try to find a proper bandwidth uh, after that. Now, this is a very simple and naive explanation of congestion control. The practice is, of course, much, much more complex. The nice thing, again, it's a black box. You don't really need to know all of these details. The main thing I want to tell you today is that most deployed algorithms today use some kind of slow start phase. And so new connections are always going to start with a very low data rate. I said before, 10 packets, that is actually the default that you get if you deploy something like a Linux server. Bigger deployments, things like CDNs, will typically have a bit higher initial congestion window. Somewhere between 30 and 40 packets is typical. Now, if you know that the typical TCP packet carries about 1.4 kilobytes of payload, and we have the 10 packets here for the default, you can see how we get to a magic number of around 14 kilobytes. And this is a number you've probably heard about before, because every so often we get a new blog post on this claiming, you know, you should fit your entire website into 14 kilobytes, and it's going to be magically much faster. What this is actually saying is kind of true. If you can fit everything inside of that very first round trip, the very first thing you do in that slow start algorithm is, of course, your site is going to be faster because it only needs the one round trip. So conceptually, I kind of agree. Practically, I have big problems with the number 14. As we just saw, that's not the case in many deployments. And it gets worse. Because the 14 is really only if you were using unencrypted HTTP. Because then you run your HTTP request right after the TCP handshake when you have the congestion window available. Of course, we no longer do that, hopefully. We all properly use TLS for security. And TLS has its own handshake that will also use the initial congestion window. It typically doesn't use the full 14 kilobytes. It's usually a little bit less. But this means that by the time you get to your H2 request, you will have more data available already. It gets more interesting with HTTP3. As you might know, that uses a new transport protocol called QUIC. And QUIC not only combines transport and cryptographic handshake, it also uses slightly smaller packets, at least in the beginning of the connection. They grow large later, but in the beginning, QUIC packets are only about 1.2 kilobytes in size. So you still have the same concept, but the eventual number you get is still somewhere between the two left ones. And these numbers are not fixed. Again, this really depends on many factors, but it's to give you an idea of the order of magnitude. It gets more interesting, because as you might have heard, H3 has this feature called Zero RTT. Again, it's magical. You can send an H3 request and get some response back in the very first round trip during the handshake. It's amazing. I kind of agree with that, but due to various security-related reasons, the amount of data we actually get to send back is, in many cases, quite low. It's not going to be the full congestion window. It's going to be limited to even as low as four kilobytes. Not quite enough to fit even your head inside of that in some cases. Yeah. So the thing is, what I want to focus on is that 14 kilobytes, that number that makes absolutely no sense. It's really very dynamic, and it depends on your setup. And most sites will be using both H2 and various flavors of H3 at the same time for different uses. So you can't really optimize for this 14 kilobytes. But the main concept there is, of course, still very valid. If you can keep your main assets, your core assets, as small as possible so that they can be sent in as few round trips during the slow start phase, that is going to be good for web performance. How you do that is, of course, with techniques that you all know, hopefully love. And I would say, if you've ever wondered, you know, when would I ever need the maximum broadly compression level of 11? When is that trade-off ever going to be worth it? Well, I would say maybe those first few resources you send, your HTML, your critical CSS, your parser blocking JavaScript. 
Those need to be as small as possible so they can fit inside as few round trips so you can load these critical things ASAP. Now this whole concept of having something large going to something small, that's actually something they also had with the Lord of the Rings. Because in the story you have many different races of different heights. You have hobbits, you have dwarves, you have elves, but then of course the actors are all human. And so how did they actually do this height difference? Well, they used a variety of different techniques. So for example, in shots like this, some of the actors might be on stilts to try and appear larger. Some other shots, the hobbits, they might actually be sitting on their knees to appear shorter. Another technique that they liked to use was to use body doubles, so different actors. In this shot, you have the hobbit and the wizard. The hobbit is actually the real actor, Billy Boyd, but the wizard is not C. Ian McKellen. This is actually famous American basketball player Shaquille O'Neal, one of the tallest people in the world. <clears throat> now this concept of using various different methods to get to the same approximate end result is something we also see in protocols, especially in resource loading and prioritization. To explain that, I'm going to use a very, very simple page. We're just going to load two resources, and the CSS is going to contain a link to a font file. What happens if you go to uh, fetch this HTML? As we now know, the browser is going to send a request, and then the server is going to fill the entire initial congestion window with the HTML data. I'm going to keep on using the 14 kilobytes here, not because it's correct, because it's somewhat easier to uh, reason about. So the browser gets the first part of the HTML. It's then going to send back the acknowledgments, very important. It's going to discover the two resources and request them as well. What then happens at the server starts to get interesting. The server now doubles its congestion window, now has 20 packets, nice. But now it needs to make a decision. How do I fill these 20 packets? Because there are three possible resources. It could say, you know, I'm just going to keep on sending the HTML. It could say, well, I've heard from people that the CSS is actually kind of important when loading a web page, so maybe I should start sending the CSS first. It could also say, well, CSS is OK, but JavaScript is also crucial, especially for modern SPA websites, right? So maybe I can s divide my packets, share bandwidth, between the two resources. You can even go crazy. You could say, I'm going to switch which resource I send in each individual packet. Now I'm going to give you all a second to think about this. You don't have to say anything. Just think about it. Which of these options do you think is faster for web performance, better for web performance? The top two or the bottom two? Just think about that for a second. Right, so the answer here is the top two. Those are better. But why? Well, this is mostly because JavaScript and CSS need to be loaded in full before they can actually be applied or executed on the page. This is different from things like HTML or some image formats. Those can be used incrementally, streaming as they come in. But that's not true for JS and CSS. You might compile or parse them in a streaming fashion, but you need to have them fully downloaded to actually get used. And you see, if you start doing this round-robin multiplexing, changing what you send each packet, you're actively delaying when those resources are downloaded. If you do the first ones, they will actually be loaded fully much earlier, much faster to be used on the page. So let's say the server knows this. It says, OK, I'm going to fill my 20 packets with the CSS. That gets sent back to the browser. Browser again sends acknowledgments, now discovers the font, and we are back at the server again. But it's more complicated this time because now it has more packets to fill and even more stuff to choose from. So I could keep going, but I think the general idea is clear, right? And that is that the order in which we fill these packets can have a very big impact on your web performance metrics. And the thing is, the server doesn't always have enough information to do this correctly. 
For example, the server here would not know if this is actually a synchronous JavaScript in the head or if this is something tagged as async or defer. Similarly, if there would have been an image here, the server would not know if that image would be above or below the fold. This is not information the browser sends to the server. So the only party in this communication that knows about this is indeed the browser. So what I've just been explaining is not exactly how it works. The server does not make these decisions. The browser does. How that happens is that for each request the browser makes, it is going to send what is called a priority, an indication of the resource's importance to the server. That makes it much easier for the server. The server, it needs to fill packets. It just needs to look at what the browser told it. In this case, the browser said, hey, HTML, super important. And the server says, well, OK, I'm just going to send the HTML. Nice, easy to do. That's the concept. That's what we want to happen. Of course, there are a lot of problems with this in practice, both on the browser and the server side. For example, a lot of servers simply don't listen to browsers. So we did a few tests a couple of years ago. The top is what the browser actually wants to happen. As we said, sequential downloads, that's the best. And we can see that even some very well-known web servers don't do this very well. In fact, at that point, Node.js completely ignored what the browser was telling it, and it did this kind of worst case for web performance round-robin multiplexing. I revisited it a couple of months ago, and it's still not much better. A lot of H2 and also HTTP3 servers kind of still get this wrong. I don't actually want to name and shame anyone uh, right now. Just take it from me. This is still a big problem in practice that can have an impact on your page loads. And the thing is, even if your server gets it right, even if you're at a party with a good server, things can still go wrong because the browsers have also two problems. Firstly, they don't agree with each other on what's actually important. And even if they would agree, it would probably not be what you as a developer expect. And I have a few examples of this. So I looked at this uh, a couple of months ago for the three browsers, seeing how they actually assign priorities to different types of resources. You can see they all kind of agree that HTML is indeed quite important. That's what you might expect. CSS, the bottom line, also quite important. Slightly more important than Chrome than the other two, but still OK. But if you look at the middle one, the fonts, you can see that Firefox does not care about your branding marketing team. OK? It does not care about all your custom fonts, which is exactly the opposite of what Chrome is doing. Chrome says fonts are almost as important as, or <laughs> equally as important as HTML and CSS. I don't know about you, but I find that kind of weird. It gets worse. Let's look at what happens with JavaScript. Let's first look at Chrome and Firefox. The JavaScript in the head, parser blocking, of course, high priority. I think we can agree on that. After this, however, every, every other type of JavaScript, Firefox says, oh, well, that's all kind of the same to me. It's all medium priority. Chrome is a bit more fine-grained. It says, OK, async and defer should probably be a lower priority because the uh, developer doesn't expect those to be uh, parser blocking. Yeah? So I'm not sure, but I think that you as a developer would expect what Chrome is doing here. Yeah? This feels good as a developer, how you understand these features. Let's go on Firefox. Hold on to your seats, because we're going to look at what Safari does. So in case it's not clear, Safari <laughs> assigns the same priority for all types of JavaScript. It doesn't matter if it's in the head or if it's in the bottom. All the JavaScript is equally important, except for async. That's slightly less important. I find that very weird. I would have expected that to be defer. Defer would be lower priority. Async would be the same. I'm sure there are people here who work on the browsers who can give a very deep technical explanation on why this actually makes sense. My point is, it does not make sense to you as a front-end developer. Probably, you would not have expected this to happen. And oh boy, 
it gets worse. Let's look at the next example. You have a largest contentful paint image. You have been told by many people, if you want to load that faster, you should use preload, right? Always a good idea to preload the LCP image. The question I have now is, what do you think this does to the priority of the image? So compared to a normal image in the body of your HTML, what do you think preload does? Does it make it a higher priority, the same, or maybe a lower one? Again, think about this for a few seconds. I'm going to give you the answer because I think most people will get this wrong anyway. To understand that, let's first look at what, what is the default priority of an image. An image in the body, it's going to start at low or maybe medium. I think everybody can agree that is somewhat expected, right? Images are less important than JavaScript and CSS. That's fine. Now again, prepare yourself for what happens if we actually preload the image. It's lower priority in Safari. Now, am I saying that Safari is the new Internet Explorer? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> but that is not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make, again, is that this is unintuitive. What you probably expected, most of you would have expected what Chrome is doing in this last line, right? Preload, higher priority, should go up the line. That is not what happens. To get this result, you actually need something additional, which is called the new uh, fetch priority attribute. Yeah? So preload by itself, it doesn't actually change priorities, at least not on images. <coughs> it only uh, changes when the request is sent. If you want to actually change priorities, you also need this new fetch priority tag. Now, I'm a big fan of fetch priority to give us more control over that. And you don't have to use it combined with preload. You can also just use this on, for example, your image tags directly. You can also lower the priority of some resources. For example, I like this use case where you have a carousel where only the first image is visible at the start. All the other ones can actually be lower priority. There are many other use cases you can do, even for JavaScript and fonts, for example. Those are all nicely listed on the web.dev link um, below. <coughs> for now, this is only in Chrome, but other browsers are actually actively working on this. Barry uh, recently tweeted a screenshot from Safari Tech Preview, so this is also coming to both Safari and Firefox in some kind of a near future. Now I can keep going because these priorities are not the only things that decide when things are actually downloaded. Browsers are much more complex. For example, here, this is a test page I had. All of these resources are discovered by the browser at exactly the same time. But you see, the browser will artificially decide to delay requesting some of them to make sure they don't contend with the higher priority resources. And Chrome has something very similar. They call it, I think, the tight mode. And it really depends on a lot of factors, what gets sent when. Again, I don't want to go too deep into this, because the end conclusion, the result, will be the same as for priorities. And that is that resource loading behavior in modern browsers is incredibly complex. It's also very inconsistent and unpredictable across different conditions and pages. And I think this is a massive problem, because I think we often focus way too much on, this should say, Chromium, right? the Chromium engine, because there you have metrics like the Core Web Vitals that we like to track. This means that if you start optimizing performance, you're probably mainly using the Chromium engine. And you're kind of forgetting the WebKit-based browsers, basically Safari and everything on iOS, because they don't have things like the Core Web Vitals to easily measure. And so what I think is that a lot of your pages are probably quite a bit slower on iOS than you might think, that you might know. Because a lot of optimizations you do for Chromium might not hold in Safari, as I've just given a few examples of. Now, sadly, I have no good solutions <laughs> to this problem at this time. So I'm just going to leave you with that and go to the next topic, which is preload. 
I just talked about preload a little bit uh, in relation to the priorities, but it's also interesting by itself. To understand that, I'm going to use another simple page. This page will just load a JavaScript. That JavaScript will eventually set the largest contentful paint image through a JavaScript call. As you all know, that is not best practice. Yeah, Please don't do this. But I'm also sure that all of you have seen this in the wild. Yeah, And again, what you've been told, if you have this situation, one option is well, just add a preload for the image. Everything will be much better. You know What is probably going to happen, if you look at these kind of diagrams from the Google developer advocates, is that without preload, it's going to take a long while. And then with preload, magically, automatically, your image is going to arrive much sooner. Now, this sometimes can happen, but in a lot of cases, this actually won't. This has again to do with what we talked about before, this slow start, this congestion window stuff. If you have a new connection, let's say this will be at around the third uh, round trip on that connection, let's say, for example, you only have 40 packets available to send actual data. Now, I don't know about you, but I would probably still like to fill those 40 packets with my JavaScript. Yeah, I still want my JavaScript to be loaded as fast as possible. The only way that this is actually going to happen is if the JavaScript is small enough to only take a part of the congestion window, and we actually have packets left over to fill with our image. And again, yes, this might happen, but I'll argue that's far from the common case. And it gets worse, because if you try to do this on one of those bad servers, those servers that don't listen to the browser when it comes to priorities, you can actually make things much, much worse. Yeah? If the server starts doing this, you actually delay when your JavaScript is downloaded, or you can actually get a full priority inversion. I've seen both of these things happen in practice. The irony is that the best case scenario in this setup is actually the first one, <laughs> the one without preload. Yeah? Now, there is a lot of nuance here. Okay? It really depends on the type of connection. This is only for new connections. If you have a warmed up connection, let's say the second page load forward, with a much larger congestion window, the JavaScript might already be cached, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of nuance to be found here. But <coughs> the point remains that preload rarely works as you would expect. There are some cases in which it will work, even for those new connections. This is, for example, one. We add a fourth resource into the mix, a deferred JavaScript. What you see, this deferred JavaScript gets sent, at least partially, before we actually get to send the image. Why is this? Well, both the JavaScript files are, of course, defined inside of the HTML. The browser can request them immediately. And by the time the server is done sending the JavaScript, the bundled JavaScript, it now has some time to send other stuff. It doesn't know about the image yet, because it wasn't preloaded. And so it can send some of the lower priority deferred JavaScript. This is one of the things that preload does help in this situation. Because now, of course, the server knows about the image right after it's done sending the JavaScript, and it can start sending that immediately without wasting time on the deferred JavaScript first. Yeah? So again, quite complex, many different cases in which preload behaves differently. And I think this is also why preload is often quite misunderstood. People just spray preloads everywhere, hoping this will work, sometimes to extreme <laughs> events where you have hundreds of preloads on a page. Um, my advice would be the same as Harry Roberts here. Please use them less, only in situations where they will actually have a larger impact. They also have interesting uh, uh, interactions with priorities, again. I don't have time to go into this today, but I would like you to think about this brain teaser. Maybe come talk to me about it during lunch or during one of the breaks. What you think will happen to priorities if you preload an async or defer JavaScript? The answer might surprise you. <coughs> now, I've been talking about web performance for quite a while. I know we all think that's a very boring topic. So let me switch to something that we all find a lot more interesting, which is, of course, women with beards. Now, in the Lord of the Rings movies, there is a scene 
where Kim Lee the Dwarf, he says, it's true you don't see many dwarf women. And one of the other characters replies, well, it's because of the beards. Indicating that dwarf women have quite a bit masculine features, apparently. And this whole concept, uh, oh no, uh, <laughs> quite a, uh, masculine features, apparently. And there's another scene in the extended version of the third movie, where they're having a party, and the dwarf is drunk, and he says, it's the dwarves that go swimming with little hairy women. And if you don't agree that that is one of the greatest lines ever written for any movie, I don't think we can be friends. This is simply amazing, yeah? Now this concept of the masculine strong woman is actually something that is present in the main story as well, in the character of the princess Eowyn, who desperately wants to join the battle, wants to go to war to help defend her country, but she can't because she's a woman. So what she decides to do is to dress up like one of the male soldiers and ride into battle. And this has a very good climax because she actually ends up killing one of the main antagonists of the story. Talk about girl power. Now the final anecdote about this that I really like is that if you see actors in these big scenes where they have a lot of the horses, the riders of Rohan, again, canonically, all of these are male soldiers. In practice, the actors are actually almost all of them women <laughs> with fake beards and fake mustaches. Because at the time, they couldn't find enough men that had their own horses in New Zealand to come act as extras in these scenes. So they actually invited also the local women who had their own horses, and they just, you know, dressed them up as men. Nobody will ever notice. I absolutely love this, uh, this anecdote for these movies. Now, this whole concept of replacing something inferior, the men, with something superior, is also something that we have seen in the HTTP protocol, with, of course, the much maligned feature server push. Up until now, I've been pretending that if you do a request for your HTML, the server can immediately respond with the payload data. You, of course, all know that that is not true in many cases. Sometimes you have to wait for the page to render, for example, waiting for a database call to happen. During this time, your network is kind of idle, even though it could be sending stuff. This time is something we sometimes referred to as the server think time. Now, if you add a CDN, an edge, into the mix, it becomes even more complex. Because now you not only have the server think time at the origin, you also have the round trip between your edge server and the origin. Well, there we go. You also have this. And so your connection between the browser and the edge is actually idle for a very, very long time. This is a very large window of opportunity where we could be sending stuff to the browser. And it's this window that server push was intended to use. There we go. The idea was quite simple. While waiting for the HTML, I'm already going to push payload for the resources that I know the browser will need, CSS, JavaScript. This has double. Uh, benefits because the browser not only has these resources, this also warms up the connection. It increases the congestion window. So by the time the HTML returns from the origin, you can actually send it in probably one or two round trips directly to the browser. So push conceptually is a very powerful feature. The problem is again that there were several issues in how it uh, could be used. For example, it was very difficult to know which resources the browser already had cached. And so you often ended up over-pushing, pushing useless data, because the browser already had it. Secondly, you could only push resources on the same domain as your HTML, which is ever so slightly less flexible. Finally, and most importantly, there were a lot of inconsistencies and even bugs across the different browsers. Where have we heard that one before? So what the end result was, was that push was actually deprecated in Chromium, I think last year, and it was never actually implemented for HTTP 3, even though officially it is still in the H3 standard. So this is kind of bad because, again, the concept here is quite sound. It's very powerful. It's just a push mechanism that was underperforming. 
This is why we have now tried to replace this with a new mechanism that is called 103 early hints. Conceptually, it's very similar, but instead of actually sending the payload data directly, so instead of sending actual data for the CSS, we are first going to send early hints, which are basically just links to resources you would need. What that looks like is also something you already know. It's basically just preloads and pre-connects. Usually, you'd put those in the HTML, but of course, we don't have HTML yet. That's what we're waiting for for the server. So instead of that, we use the HTTP response headers to convey this information. Yeah? So slightly different syntax, but almost exactly the same in concept. What this does, you send the preload links and the pre-connects to the browsers. The browser is now in the full control. It can decide and look, which of these do I already have in the cache? If I have them, I don't request them again. It can properly prioritize the resources also something that was not possible with push. And you still get all of the other benefits from push there as well. So it's already a lot better. And it gets better again, because to me, at least, the killer feature of uh, early hints is that you can also use it to load assets that are not on the same domain as the HTML. You can use this for secondary domains or even third parties. This means that while all of this is happening, while the browser is loading this, it will also be able to do this in parallel. Let's say, for example, you have a separate domain for some static assets where you want to load your font from. Well, you can start connecting and loading the font from that separate domain while everything else is getting loaded. Again, crucial difference. This was not possible with push. And we are currently running a proof of concept on Akamai for this, and the results are actually quite Amazing. This is without one or three early hints. And you can see we have to wait until the HTML actually comes in before we can discover all these resources and start requesting them, as you would expect. Now, with early hints, the results are, in my opinion, quite staggering. They start getting requested much, much, much earlier. And they are actually fully downloaded by the time the HTML even comes in, even the third-party resource for which we needed a separate connection. And it has a secondary performance impact there, because again, here, browsers would artificially delay these images. So I told before, they delay these images, even though they know about them, waiting for this to come in, while here, they can immediately start requesting the images when the uh, HTML comes in, because they can't contend with detailed resources. So you get double performance benefits from this feature. There is a caveat, though, something very important that I want to explain here. The question is, which resources are you actually going to preload in your early hints? Because what you've been taught, what you probably think, you know, if I'm preloading anything, it is late discovered resources. Fonts that are in a CSS file, my hero image that was in the JavaScript, that's what I'm going to preload. I'm not going to preload my core CSS, my initial JavaScript. That wouldn't make sense in HTML, because those links are usually right below the preloads. So the browser would discover them uh, anyway. That's what you're used to. With 103 early hints, this flips completely. 103 early hints, we do not have the HTML yet. You don't know about these core resources quickly. And so what you want to preload in early hints is actually the exact opposite of what you want to preload in your HTML. And this is something that I've seen a lot of blog posts and even conference talks about this new feature get completely wrong. They still use examples as if this is what you're preloading. Well, really, very arguably, it should be this. So please think long and hard on what you're going to be early hinting if you decide to start using this feature. Now, to be honest, I don't want to cast too much shade on other people talking about this, because it's not easy. Preload is a very overloaded term in modern web performance. It's constantly being reused for slightly different purposes. And then we also have something called the preload scanner, which has absolutely nothing to do with the preload feature. OK? So it's really not your fault, again, if you're confused by all of this, if you use this badly. 
It's the fault of people who keep on using the preload term to mean different things. Now, I really don't want to end this talk on a rant. I want to have a positive end result. So let's try and combine something from the start with something now at the end. At the beginning, I talked about the zero RTT feature. Very fast, but you only had a limited amount of data that you could use there. Not very useful for, for example, sending an HTML. However, if we combine this with the early hints, that becomes much more interesting because the early hints are really just links. Those will fit nicely and snugly within that four kilobytes. So this is really a perfect combination of the two features, saving us yet another full round trip on the server. Now this is, I don't think there is any deployment that currently allows you to do this, but it will be very interesting to see what we can do with this once people start rolling this out. With that, it's time to conclude, finally. Sadly, again, I can't make very strong recommendations. I don't have a nice list of 10 things you should do to better use preload or priorities, um, because it really depends on your page and what you want to achieve. The main thing I hope is clear now is that all of this is very, very complex. And we have this black box of the network that you probably don't understand as well as you think you do or you would like to. And so sometimes you might make mistakes using these features. So it's probably good to go back and rethink what you're exactly doing because you might actually be foot gunning yourself with this. The other thing that may be clear but I want to emphasize here is that if you want to really fine tune your web performance, you really need a decent network or network protocol configuration. And this is, again, very complex to do yourself. Especially tuning congestion algorithms, making sure prioritization works, and really, really implementing or deploying H3 yourself is very, very difficult. So what I would say, something you probably all know, is to use a CDN. A CDN makes this all much easier for you. And trust me, I would be saying this even if I was not employed by one of the CDNs on this image. OK. With that, they've told me that there are maybe a few questions. But after that, luckily, we can go to lunch. And so I would already say thank you all and bon appétit. Thank you very much, Robin, for this exciting uh, presentation. Do you have questions for Robin? Uh, yeah, so uh, my question was about the, um, the caviar, about the how, do, how do we need to invert the, the pre... No, it's, it's, uh, it's the hint. Uh, the I didn't hint, yeah. get the hint, by the way. I uh, didn't get why we should invent it, uh, invert it. Mm. Good question. So, so the question is, why should you use... Why should you early hint other resources? Well, you can still preload the normal preload resources. The thing is, the browser won't be able to use them immediately. Because those are like, let's say, fonts, images. The browser still needs your CSS and JavaScript before it can start using those things. So yes, it will be faster once <laughs> those actually arrive. But it's better, it's even more fast, to actually send the JavaScript and the CSS first, and then wait for the fonts and images to come afterwards, because the browser can already start parsing and executing. Uh, those things as well. Does that make sense? M much clearer, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? D'autres questions? People are hungry. Hello. Uh, we've been experiencing with uh, LA Ins, and I'm here. Oh, there. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, what's your tips to help um, not debug, but see the differences between, uh, between using early ints and not, be because sometimes it's very hard to measure it. Uh, we're using Cloudflare, for example, and when the page is cached, they're not using early ints, because it adds, it's more uh, time uh, consuming than not using them on some cases. So when I use web page tests, it becomes hard to see 
if there is any benefit or not. I completely agree. Tooling support at this point is terrible. Uh, it's very difficult to validate this. Um, we are actually we found quite a few bugs in this ourselves doing this, and we are talking to the Chrome team uh, even today <laughs> about how we might solve this. So uh, I agree, it's very difficult. I hope the tooling will improve, and then you will be able to use things like web page tests uh, as you normally would. Uh, but for now, yes, it's very difficult to validate what the impact actually um, what the impact actually can be. So I can't really help you today. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Is uh, one of these bugs uh, having two same requests for the, the same images, for example, if you're using early ints or not? Just b out of your curiosity. Um, that's one of the bugs we found, yes. Okay, we've been experiencing the same exactly. since June. Yeah. Okay, thank that's you. Uh, one more question? Yes, hello. I was wondering if uh, it's possible to optimize the multiplexer in Nginx and maybe Node.js as well, or just use the CDN? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't want to cast too much shade on those projects because they're generally good projects. Um, as far as I know, Node.js still has this problem, and they won't fix it for H2. And for H3, they're using a better library that does this uh, better. Um, Nginx, as far as I know, um, they also don't want to fix this. This has led to companies like Cloudflare that use Nginx internally to have their own patches, their own implementation of this logic to improve this. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if the Cloudflare patches are open source. I think they used to be at some point. I'm not sure that's still the case. But so, as far as I know, no, it's not possible to improve Nginx. But I do think that Nginx is better than what I showed uh, on the slide, because that was a few years ago. Je crois qu'on ne peut plus prendre de questions, malheureusement. Merci beaucoup, Robin. Bravo à lui. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you.